riding down Highway 61 Sides of the roads all lined with fields Nothing but sunset in the windshield Feel it as soon as I ride into town This is where I go to slow down Miles and miles of soybeans and corn I'm in the place where the blues was born Chapel back with the Crappie Connection at the Crappie Expo in Shreveport, Louisiana. I got old my buddy on the end there, Todd. Hey, man. Also got Mike and Tony Shepard, Big T and Big M on me. Hey. Hey, hey. <laughs> you know, we're going to kind of go back, and I know they fished this expo, and they kind of have uh, a good insight of uh, how this lake fished and some some mistakes or some opportunities that you might have done different on this deal because everybody has them after a tournament's over with if they didn't win it oh yeah what would you have done different and what did you learn from tournament fishing this particular tournament uh on this tournament i think well we really wasn't ever on the winning stringer fish right i don't think I, we ever saw you know 11 or 12 pound stringer mm -hmm. on our live scope uh but you know we could have competed a lot better than we did but we didn't make the right choices. Mm -hmm. uh, we had fish found that we thought no one else would find. So we're going to save them for day two. Started off in the spot, didn't work out. Push the panic button, lock through, run down there, waste time, then get down there. And of course, 10 other boats done found that too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we should have went to the fish instead of trying to play safety. Right. And yeah, that's anything when you went your fishing tournaments it's all about making the right choices at the right time and and fishing clean right i mean like you know for instance when we won hamilton uh i think the first day at 9 30 we quit fishing really yeah i mean we had Dirty dog. we had you know we knew we had enough to compete yeah. you know we know we'd be up there we didn't know we'd be leading mm -hmm. but we knew we didn't have that many fish either so we had to save our spots i know you you know you've won a national championship you know before live scope and how much has changed in the the tournament as far as the scenery of guys competing and even techniques and you know you've been through a lot of different tournaments to kind of see how that history comes into play now yeah i mean you know started off with eight poles out the front you know mm -hmm. you're covering water but you had to fish slow and effective and now you fish fast and effective because you're watching everything on tv mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean that's just that's the way it's changed and uh but you know one thing it goes back to winning crappie masters national champion the Wally Marshall Expo mm -hmm. at Hamilton. It all goes back to using small baits. Mm -hmm. You know, when we won at Washington, we had boats mm -hmm. around us and they couldn't catch seven fish and we were catching yep. 40 a day and we were using the little old bitty inch plastic, you know, with a 30 second ounce head and a mm -hmm. half ounce weight above it trolling real slow. And, you know, people were fishing minnows and couldn't get bit. Yeah. But we, you know, a minnow was too big. Right. A minnow was too big. And the same way with Hamilton, you know, was using the, the mermaid but we was only using the tail of it with a 30 second ounce head and it, it always goes back looking back hindsight you know fishing small baits under pressure is always a key it seems to be working for you or, or it has in the past for sure yeah but, it's it, it's it really blowing my mind how many of these this time of the year tournaments are being won mm -hmm. on really small stuff I mean, and, it, and it's not just this time of the year, but it seems like this time of the year it's a definite. Like yeah. you've got to be fishing a small bait. With, but I, I think some of it too, because some of the teams that I talked to were talking about, you know, using a full size bait the first couple of days of pre fishing, mm -hmm. and they could get bit on it. Oh yeah, that that was the the problem with this river system is 
you had an old fish out on the river. Mm -hmm. it, I wonder why that was. I mean, what? I don't, I don't understand it. We spent hours and even talked to Ronnie and Steve about it. You know, they mm -hmm. couldn't find them, and, you know, they're pretty good out oh, on yeah. the river. But, uh, you know, it to the small baits, you take a river like this, and all these fish was congregated in the thickest, gnarliest timber. It was hard to find any open water fish. Mm -hmm. And then the pressure of everybody in there on it, and it just, you know, all week long, the bite kept, kept getting worse. And then you start downsizing, downsizing. And it just, you know, it you take away side scan too in, in this tournament because them fish in that timber, right. you can't drive through it and right. see where they're at. You've got to fish your way through it. Then you get a little luck and then the panic, you know, mm -hmm. you know, should we go on? 200 more yards and run into them? Did they slide back or do we make a move? You know, it, them decisions, so that they'll kill you or yeah. make you. Yeah. I know myself looking back four years ago and I believe I even heard Todd say in the past, I, I always use big baits. You know, four to five years ago, you know, a small bait for me was a two and a half inch. I mean, and this particular summer, looking back from years, I would always struggle in the heat of the summer, and now I know why was profile. Mm -hmm. And profile has changed crappie fishing, not only live scope has, but also people really realize these smaller baits are are our big key. Um, and it's going to be interesting, you know, to see how the the winner of this tournament turns out and what they did to win this thing. And uh, by this airs, I mean it'll be out by then. But we're all kind of sitting on pins and needles waiting on this finish today because it's. It was a tough tournament, what I've been told. I, have, I was not out there, but you know, I talked to Tony, Mike, and dozens of other people, and they say how tough it was. But um, it's just it's been really neat to watch this one. You know, Tony, when yeah. when y'all won Hot Springs, um, I remember everybody saying, <laughs> "Yeah, they're going to win it because this fish is like your home lake." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we really. It kind of was like dumb luck, I guess, because, with, you know, we really just started casting like six or eight months prior to Hot Springs. You know, we had the Asian carp in Kentucky Lake, and I'd figured out that, you know, if you got up in one pole and, get, and spooked the carp off the fish, I've said it a thousand times, you don't catch but one or two fish, but you can hold back and cast and let your jig fall through the carp and not spook them and catch four, five, seven fish off of the spot. And I knew, clear water that would probably work everywhere you know take the carp equation out of it but you're still staying back and you're pulling them fish out instead of just straight through the rest of them up you know and we just got really comfortable casting and i thought well we'll just try it there and when we got there it worked you know it, it was just like kentucky lake it was just perfect you know and then like last year with jerry hancock winning table rock mm -hmm. that, that was no shock because he fishes Lake Fork, deep standing timber. Yep. The guy's leading this tournament now, guide on Millwood that fishes just like this. And it seems to be this common deal of, you know, you and I were talking, I guess it was yesterday. Right. And you, we were talking about standing timber, and you're like, I don't like it. I don't, I, 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 I don't like it. I don't like getting <laughs> mm -hmm. in this stuff. I don't either. Which is what this lake is. And so it, it's pretty interesting to me when we look at, when I was breaking it down after you and I were talking, I was like, you know, the last three years, the guys who have done good have been on a lake that is what they're used to right. fishing. Right. Fish, kind of fit their style and what they're accustomed right. to day in so and day out. So the, the live sonar has helped, but it's only helped those who are used to looking at fish on those right. conditions. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, like on Table Rock, we found plenty of fish, but I don't ever fish that deep. Mm -hmm. And so I was lost. Right. Sometimes I'd drop a bait down and be like, oh, I'm right on him. And George would drop like over here somewhere. And I'd be like, you're on him, you know, because of that cone <laughs> angle fishing right. that deep. Well, everybody, you know, grew up on their home lake. And that's what style of fishing they adapted to, you know. So when you go to a new lake, you're going to fish your strength or try to. You're going to be more productive. And when you start taking yourself and putting yourself in other elements like me in timber, trying to one pole, you know, 
I'm not even used to looking at fish on timber like that. You know, I see a bright dot stuck to a tree, and I'm like, is that a big fish? Is that a fish? You know, I mm -hmm. can't see a fish, but there could be a fish hid there. You know, we was talking about that yesterday. Oh, yeah. And, and there's a lot of stuff that, you know, I don't get to practice on Kentucky Lake that you do down here. And it's that way for everybody. And I think that's what it is when you go to a, a tournament like this, that there's only a few days pre-fishing and a year's off limits. When they get there, it's like whoever's strength lines up with that lake is going to have the best odds of winning. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think we'll I think we'll see that today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it'll really be do. interesting. Yeah, it's definitely going to be an interesting finish. But uh, let's talk a little bit about Jenko. What they got coming up with some new stuff. We want to bust uh, out some news out here. Which you know, ICAST was a couple of months ago when we come out. This is Mike's baby. It's called the Go Digger. Mm -hmm. It's just a smoke with solid gold flake. I'd come out with uh, the silver one last year, and Mike said, let's do a gold one. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, we'll call it whatever you want to call it. And he said, let's call it Gold Digger. I and, like uh, it. We was fishing the tournament. We only had like five baits of this as a prototype. Mm -hmm. And uh, we was on Kentucky Lake. And we won the tournament. And there was a fish in a brush pot. I'd cast it at like seven or eight times and couldn't catch it. And he said, let me get old Gold Digger up. Was it a female crappie? No, it was <laughs> It wasn't. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I was just wondering. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> Uh, but he said, let me get the gold digger out. He threw it out there and caught it. And he's like, yeah. oh, gold digger, dug her out. And he uh, just started laughing like a little kid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we got that color. And then, uh, you know, we've had the mermaid out for several years. We come out mm -hmm. with the baby mermaid. It's an inch and a half, you know, going back down to downsize. And I was like, we got to make it smaller because I love the bait. And mm -hmm. I'm tearing them in half to use them, so I might as well make one smaller. Yeah. So we did that. And uh, this blue colored head here. It was something Kevin Rogers put on his hair jigs, and people love that color. I do. Do you? I, yeah, I do. I, I, don't, I don't know about the fish, but I just like the color. <laughs> I don't fish it that much. I mean, I've tried it a few times, but I don't know. It's just I've never used blue on a Do head. you think that that head color makes a big difference? Water color and head color go hand in hand, like Kentucky Lake. Mm -hmm. I'd just soon have a black, a white, or a lead. Grenada, I want an orange or a pink. You know, it's watercolor to me. Is it more confidence or do you think it actually makes a difference? <laughs> My confidence is in natural baits. 99% of the time, I'm gonna have something natural on. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the fish aren't reacting, if they're not moving to hit my bait, then I'll probably throw on some color and see if I can get that fish to move two foot to hit my bait. Because there is days that there's a color that's better than the rest. I believe crappie fishermen have got so much to learn from bluegill and trout. Hmm. As far as our baits, our line, you know, in these high pressure situations like on this river where these fish are getting beat up, I mean, how many times have you went to the dock and there are bluegill swimming around, you pitch a bait out there and they just look at it and swim off? They know. I mean, you can sit there and see them mm -hmm. and they know. And if, if you get more live bait, you know, a line they can't see, same way with trout, you know, then you make them bite. And, and I think that's the direction we're headed. I really do. Hmm. The fish are getting smarter. Yeah. To the last scope. They're, yeah. they're, they're knowing. You know, I mean, you think about it, you used to, you'd see a fish on 2D and you try to catch it and it moved off, you left it alone. You didn't know where it went. Now you chase them. Right. And they're knowing. They're, they're getting smarter. Mother Nature <laughs> take care of itself. Me. What about you, Ty? What do you think about the head color? Oh, <laughs> I've, I've seen days where, mm -hmm. so I, I get this question every day from clients. And right. I'll, I'll, my, my personal opinion is, is there's, de there's very few days where it matters, but those days it matters a lot. Mm -hmm. That's on my lake. I, I just, Some days I'll have eight rods laid on the deck of the boat and I'll have eight different color baits on there and whichever one you pick up if you present it correctly delete it mm -hmm. then there's other days where it makes all the difference in the world right especially like up at gibson in the clear water the black species it matters a lot don't you agree black crappie is a lot more picky oh than, than the whites oh yeah they're very picky. last fall up there and you know there's a couple guys that are in this building that have talked to me about it but Last fall up there, I couldn't get bit on a hair jig, and I could not get bit on plastic, and I could not get bit on a minnow. But if I cut the back end of that minnow off about that much of its tail and put it on a hair jig, we'd catch every one of them. Really? 
that they wouldn't bite a whole minute. I had to just be a little piece of it. Yeah. Profile and presentation to me is way more important in court and than the color. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think Lyscott definitely has taught us that. It's, you know, <laughs> but I still think there's days that, because I can fish a brush pile and cast to it, you know, and catch them real good, and they'll kind of go dormant or sour or however you want to look at it, and then I'll change that color up and even change profile, and that can change the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But but that's one of the things that I, I like doing is changing that color up some. With, with, with you cutting that minnow off, do you think it was a profile or do you think it was a scent? Oh, I think it was the amino acids in it, for sure. You know, I've, I've been offshore too much and seen what these guys can do with chum mm -hmm. to get fish fired up. Yeah. And it's never a whole bait, it's chunks. And they do that because it's releasing that amino acid is right. their theory right. behind it. But, you know, waxworms sometimes for a black crappie on a jig right. will make a difference. Um, the, the, like, like we said, we've we've all still got so much to learn. <laughs> but, yeah. And as these fish get more pressured and, you know, like what you said, and I was talking to, um, oh, I can't remember the guy's name, the guy with Wired to Fish, I was talking to him this spring. Jason Seelock? Yep, mm -hmm. about that. He called me and asked me. And then two nights ago, we was talking to Jerry Hancock about it. Mm-hmm. These fish now, when, when, when Live Scope first came out, these fish were not recognizing us. I agree. Mm -hmm. Now, just like what Jerry said, and I agree with him a million percent, I'll tell my clients, your bait has to be on the left side of that fish. That fish is always facing left because he's looking at the boat. <laughs> very, very rarely if you're on the right side of him will you catch him, that's his tail. Because especially on standing timber, they're going to turn and they're going to look at the boat, and that's on that left side that's hitting him first. They're they're turning and looking at us. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, just like showing up here the first day, like Brad said, you know, you could catch them on a two-inch bait, and they were easy to catch. You know, they weren't spooky. You could get right on top of them. You could one pole them with a the seven-foot rod if you wanted to. But now, you know. As the week went on and the fish got fished, I mean, you'd see the big ones start, if they left, they was going to leave it like 30 foot. When you got 30 foot, you know, or, and then like he could go back to the back of the boat, change baits, just walking in the boat, you'd see them take off. I mean, they were, they're getting pressure. Oh yeah, I heard a lot of people say, man, when we left Darbone, you know, it was tough fishing and everything. We got down here and man, the first two days we were like, oh, thank God, we're on a lake <laughs> yeah. where they'll bite, you know? And then by the third day, they're yeah. like, oh, this has turned into dark Back in the again. same spot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it, this this river system here probably hadn't been exposed to live scope right. as hard as dark bone. Right. And the fish react the same way as it, you know, as any well, other I, I saw that's been fished. So. I saw next year one of the trails was going to have a seven-day off limit. And just fish at the day of the tournament. Really? Mm -hmm. Yep. That's what Make they announced. Hmm. You imagine how much improve the weights of the tournament will be because yeah. you'll pre-fish two weeks before and kind of get an idea and then them fish for a week are not going to have a bait dropped on them till tournament morning i think it'll be good yeah i think i think the fishing will be a lot better you know oh. you, you imagine grenada in the spring if them fish were left alone for seven days the first day of the tournament <laughs> what would happen <laughs> it'd be easy <laughs> because i mean look at what they did there this last spring you know set all-time records and that was after Getting grief. It, it, I mean, pounded. Right. Because I was seeing it all over social media. These guys the day before the tournament that were holding up two and three quarter and three pounders, <laughs> and I'm like, why are they catching them? They're free fishing. But yeah, I think that'll make a huge difference. Got it too. And it, it it should be good for all of us that are in the bait business because now we'll start having teams catch them on the big baits again. Mm -hmm. True. That's true. Yeah. I didn't think about that. but that's So there will be some tournaments where they catch them on big bait, and some tournaments they catch them on a little bait. We'll be selling all of them. Right. <laughs> it's crazy how much this has changed <laughs> through the years. I mean, I, I don't know, man. It's, it's cool to watch, and it's cool where crop fishing is going, and you know, I'm definitely excited to, to, to keep up and stay with these changes because you've got to learn, man. Yeah, I think we're just scratching the surface on what, what we'll see in the next five years. I, I, hmm. know, I know me and you talked about it, Brad, but mm -hmm. do you think uh, we'll see, you know, these fish are getting really bad about going to bottom. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll see the trolling come back? 
I think it has its days, and I think it's going to have its place still, <clears throat> just like long line and wheel and and pressured fish um, in weather conditions. And I think if I was a, a new fisherman and I wanted to fish tournaments, I would want to fish, be able to fish every technique. And I and I hope personally that people that's getting into crappie fishing just don't rely totally on live scope because there's so many different techniques that you can still really utilize and if you want to be a really good crappie fisherman you need to know them all and you need to be really good at them all i mean everybody you know if you just one dimensional i think that you're i mean you guys are definitely you know able to do it all um but i hope that the guys that are coming into the crappie fishing world tournament scene or even the regular scene is there's a lot more techniques besides live scope that's going to catch them when live scope can't um i i was told and i don't know if the guy made it to day three i would like to find out but i, I heard one of the guys in the top 10 off the first day didn't have a live scope on his boat at all that's impressive that's impressive that's impressive and so i definitely think there's going to be times that uh, will be won by old methods um like lake washington we talked about pressured fish and there was a lot of tournaments won on lake washington by guys putting out spider rigs cutting off everything in their boat i mean everything and drifting just using mother nature to push their boats cutting off their fish finders and making no noise and that to me would would be where a technique that could come back on a pressured fishery and actually win it well, and another thing that I'm seeing on Eufaula, and like me and Brian Young have talked about it this summer, that some of the guides down there, the new guides are missing, is if they cannot see them on live scope, they're not even mm -hmm. fishing. Mm -hmm. They're not even fishing. And Eufaula's pretty rocky. And if you've ever fished below a dam where there's a bunch of riprap and you drop a cork or your keys, you ain't getting them back. There's a lot of voids in those rocks. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of days where if there's a lot of boat traffic on Eufaula, these fish are in the rock. And you cannot see that fish unless you put a bait down there for him to come up and look at. The one guy was like, man, we're just making fish. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Just appearing. <laughs> right. And so we're going down through there, and whoever's on my right, and this is with two jigs, you know, kind of old school strolling type yep. of deal. But they're just holding their baits along bottom, and this guy can see his two baits on live scope. And all of a sudden, you'll just see a fish just come up out of the rocks and eat it. Well, this guy over here that's just holding his rod over here that's watching his buddy fish, he's catching the same amount of fish. And these, a lot of these other guys are coming through there because they see where we're at and they see what we're posting. And they come in there, and well, I'll watch them. They'll pull up, and, you know, they're pretty respectful. They'll pull way back behind me or something, and they'll kind of live scope it. And they don't see anything. They don't see anything. Their clients never pick up a raw. They move on. So, I, I you know, the whole trolling deal, I right. think, I think yeah. I mean, that's a – I mean, like I say, to mention Brian again, I told him, I said, dude, if you break out spider rig rods again, go down these banks – You'll smoke them. And he was like, I know, but I don't want to clean that many. So we're just going to do it this way. <laughs> right. What about you, Mike? What are you seeing? I know we talked about it, and I kind of got my opinion out. but I think, Todd, what he was saying, I see it coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember, you know, one time at, uh, we didn't we didn't have live scope at Gunnersville, did we? This last time? No, the wasn't I don't think y'all did. ACT? Anyway, we was at one tournament, and we was catching these fish, and you would not see them. And we kind of got lucky finding them. Just we had eight poles out, was drifting. It was in February, it I was think. Our, we had just gotten live scope. Yeah. And I tell you, I learned so much that day. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> I, see, I see the brain kind of but, working there. But with it, was, it was like you couldn't see these fish at all. Mm -hmm. But we had seen one come up and bite. And then we figured out, you know, you had to have this magic depth. We had to set this pole to this certain level to make them fish come up off bottom to hit that bait, you know. And by these fish, 
it, it's getting more common and common and common. I don't know if it's the summer months or it just seems like these fish are going to bottom real bad when they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I really feel like it's from pressure. And that's what's got this spider rigging may come back, mm -hmm. you know. It would have its day probably, yeah. yeah, for sure. Because, you know, I really believe there's a lot to setting that bait that height and making that fish. There's a certain spot that them fish like to come up and hit that bait. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Instead of putting it right under his nose. <laughs> right. right. I've seen that, you know, casting several times. You cast the fish and bring it, you know, just right over his nose, right over his nose, and then cast out there and lose your jig and go to reel it back in and see him come oh, yeah. up. And your jig was four or five foot above yeah, him, and he come absolutely. up and smoked it. And I was like, yep. maybe we need to reel it in faster than <laughs> higher, you know? <laughs> Don't get it near him. Right. Well, that's like what Edwin was talking about yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, he was talking about the forward-facing sonar and bass fishing. And he said he was fishing a tournament, and whenever he first got it and was throwing a topwater, well, of course, you can't see a topwater very good on it. So mm -hmm. he's working that topwater, and he said all of a sudden he saw a fish that darted, like, I think he said 15 feet. Mm -hmm. That fish was sitting on bottom, come up there, and he was reeling in to make another to cast. Okay? So he was reeling in real fast, and he sees this fish that comes up off the bottom and just stops right below the surface. And he was like, twitch twitch and caught the fish and he said you know that fish came up 15 feet mm -hmm. for a bait that obviously hadn't responded until he started reeling it in yeah quicker right and so yeah I, I that's what I, i'm talking about like just scratching the surface i think there's so much stuff like that little tricks and stuff with, that oh, you're speed. gonna learn with mm -hmm. like what brad does with long line mm -hmm. sometimes that speed of no, just getting a reaction key. yeah you know, I, I think you'll see guys that somehow utilize it pulling crankbaits again. Absolutely. I mean, those techniques were were effective. proven too effective yeah. to not mm -hmm. just throw away. Right. Yeah. And it's just like with bass fishing, you know, when the Alabama rig came out, that's what everybody was throwing. And those fish caught on to it real quick. You mm -hmm. come to you follow right now and even in the best time to throw at Alabama rig, you can't catch them. Well, everybody's still throwing it. And the guys that are out there throwing a jerk bait or a spinner bait that they put up for years now has become effective again because those fish are not seeing it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, some of these lakes after another year or two of boats chasing them with a single jig and a single fisherman and chasing them down, these fish are going to get to where they're going to get dialed in on that and, and they might even feel that the the pinging the pinging or whatever it is from the live scope and even say well yeah. i feel that presence you know mm -hmm. and then if you didn't have that presence the old school technique coming in there and shine it'd be really i'd like to know who did that so if you're out there and you listen to it and you <laughs> finish it i want to talk to you about it because that's really cool to me you know and then i think a lot too like you were talking about those fish go to the bottom because of the boat but if you're long lining mm -hmm. something out the back, I think that they go to the bottom and then you go over them. They come back up. I think they kind of forget. And then all of a sudden here comes some baits by and they're like, oh, okay. You know, it's safe now. Right. Mm -hmm. The threat has passed. Wonder how long the memory is on the fish. I don't know. I, I really don't, but I'll say this, I've, had fish halfway to the surface client has come off and it go back down there and you're like hurry hurry drop back down and he bites again right but you know when they swallow a shad you know fins poke them in the mouth and stuff so right. you know, a little hook don't bother them i had I, I yeah i mean i can't tell you now what i still think one of the coolest things ever is when clients miss a fish and about halfway up their minnow comes off and you see that fish swim up meet their minnow and then go back down <laughs> and then they put another one on and drop down and catch it and i'm like looking his throat there's because the because i saw it they were like dang it i missed yeah. him and they weren't watching the screen i'm like he ate your minnow mm -hmm. and they put another minnow on and then so i mean i think some of them remember a period of time and i think others are like I don't care. Yeah. You got the dumb blinds. That's the, probably the difference the in the big ones and the small ones. <laughs> <laughs> the big ones remember real well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those two pounders remember yeah. real well. Anything else new? Otherwise, man, I appreciate you guys coming out again. Yeah, I mean, it's just we come out with 30 seconds in the in the warhead and, and the warbird both. 
and uh, new what about, rod. What about the rod? It's an X series which we got the X10, the X13, the X15, but I wanted a really high-end casting rod because that's my deal, and 7.2, light mm -hmm. action. Is it the same height as you? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had 7.2, then I wouldn't look so fat. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. You know, was it last year in Branson, we was talking about, like, where is this going? How long can we get right, with right. rods? And it's cool because now, we got guys that are coming in that are wanting a six footer for casting and a 16 footer if they don't like casting right i never right. I, I never dreamed of a day where all of them on the scale would be selling equally right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. i mean that's that's usually our game we got a couple casting poles on the deck and a, a 13 foot rod in case we see a fish buried up somewhere we can't get to mm -hmm. yeah it used to it's kind of embarrassing you ever go to walmart and somebody walks in with wet penny shoes and you hear that quick, quick, Every time they take a step, well, yeah, we used to feel like when we was out on water, we was going. Whoosh, mm -hmm. whoosh. <laughs> now then, all you hear is. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that sound, personally. Yeah, I do too. I really like that braid coming through the yeah. lines when I got a fish yeah. on. Uh, all right, guys, uh, got any kind of comments about this podcast? Any kind of questions? Or, hey, tell us a story about when you think uh, these fish were buried, and kind of like what we're talking about today. Give us a fish story on our comments. Yeah, and if anybody out there has active captain and can show us what we're talking about, send us some video of it. Yeah. Of these fish that are just materializing out of nowhere because mm -hmm. ev everybody has had to have seen it a few times. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Till next time, Brad Chapel here. Todd Huckabee. Big T, I'm Big out. Big T. <laughs> Michael Shepard. Holla. <laughs> From Big Muddy River, a place I'll always remember. Cabin on the lake and a fishing pole. Forever here, I'll rest my soul. I could